All right, we're going to open our Bibles today to 1 John chapter 3, continuing our series in 1 John. 1 John chapter 3, we're going to be looking at verses 4 to 10 this morning, entitled The Message, The Defining Factor of Your Spiritual Life. I think as we evaluate success and failure, you can also often point to a particular factor that was crucial to the success or failure. And usually the the issue is an issue that defines the failure, not the success, because success often means that everything worked absolutely perfectly. We can see that particularly in sports where the line between winning and losing is really very small and often in the very smallest details. You look at the Olympics and and even in some of the races, the, the competition is defined by hundredths of the second in terms of who won and lost. Uh, you look at athletes who will test their equipment to the nth degree, even the aerodynamics of the clothing they wear is significant to failure or success as an athlete. We can look at this issue also, this principle in human relationships. For example, in our marriages, the quality of the relationship we have in our, with our spouse often hinges on how thoroughly biblically we communicate with one another. And so... Communication becomes really a defining factor of how well that relationship is working. As an employee, really, your success or failure really depends on how faithful you are to accomplishing the objectives that your employer has laid out for you. And so, as we can see today, there are factors, and we'll look today particularly at a defining factor in our spiritual life that we'll consider from our text, 1 John chapter 3. So let's read it. 1 John 3, we'll begin in verse 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sin, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. In this, the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. I think it's pretty obvious to see the issue I'm speaking of this morning is the issue of sin. We've already seen, as we've studied in John's letter, how significant it is. The fact that if we're going to have an ongoing fellowship with God, that sin has to be taken care of in our lives. First John 1, 6 through 7, say, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ, his son cleanses us from all sin. And so I think we understand as believers in particular the impact that sin has in our lives. And so the question I want for us to be asking ourselves today then is what is our attitude towards sin? In particular, what is our attitude toward our own sin? You see, because we often have a very clear and judgmental attitude in the lives of others. And we can sit in a service like this where we're going to talk about sin. We're going to talk about it fairly specifically And we're going to say, you know what, that guy over there really needed that message. I hope he's listening to it. And brothers and sisters, that's not the right way to listen to God's word. God's word is for you, is for me. And so we need to recognize our own attitude. How do we look at our own sin? Do we recognize the heinous nature of our sin, even as believers, and the impact that it has in our own spiritual lives? See, God has a perspective on sin, and he is completely holy and perfect and cannot tolerate it. Passage in Revelation speaks to the fact that there is nothing that sins in his presence. So we understand that. We understand we need to be righteous before him. And so I want to make sure this morning that we have really that clear and proper understanding and proper response to sin this morning. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask for his help. And then we'll look at what the Bible has for us in the writing of the Apostle John. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege we have to gather together tonight, this morning rather, as an assembly, to come together to fellowship, to interact with one another, to praise you in song, 
and to uh, fellowship around your word. I pray that as we interact with your word this morning, that, Lord, you do a work in our hearts, that your spirit would uh, illuminate the truth of your word to us, that you would help us to see it as it is written and to respond to it correctly. Father, we live in a very distracted day. We live in a day where we all have uh, frequent distractions and interruptions. But, Lord, I would pray in this time, in the next few minutes, that, Lord, you would help us to lay aside the things that would be a distraction to us and to focus completely on the truth of your word. Lord, as your messenger, I pray that my words would be what you would have today, that they would not be distracting, but that they would be consistent with your truth. And that, Lord, you do a work in our hearts, for we need to understand how, as believers, we are to deal with this issue of sin. And we need to understand your truth, and we need to walk in your light. And I pray you should help us do that today. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. As we approach the text today, I really want to address, uh, really answer three questions. I think the text lays out three questions for us, and I want to address those and really answer, ask and answer those questions that seem to fall directly out of the passage that we're considering. The first of those questions is fairly simply laid out for us in verse 4, and that is, what is the definition of sin? What is the definition of sin? Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for the sin for sin is the transgression of the law. What does that mean? And I think John really gives for us really two definitions in this one verse, one pertaining to sin itself, and then the other definition pertaining to those that commit sin, or we could just call them sinners. And so let's start with the definition of sin. It's at the end there of verse four, for sin is the transgression of the law. The word sin that's used here is the word that's translated sin here is the word that means to miss the mark. And if you look in the original, the transgression of the law is one word in the original, and it just means lawlessness or lawless deeds. Lawless deeds. So very literally, John's definition of sin is sin is lawlessness. You say, well, what is that? What does that mean? Does that mean those that are sinning just are unaware they're lawless in the sense that they don't know what the law is and they're just ignorant. No, that's not, that's not what John is saying here. Rather, what he's saying is lawlessness is an assertion of our will against God's law and really in defiance of God's law. In other words, it's a refusal to live as God has laid out. There's a one word we could call that. We call that rebellion, right? Living against God's revealed standard of good and evil, of right and wrong, rather. And that really d- demonstrates a hu- the human nature that is hostile towards God. One author put it this way, sin is a deliberate deviation from an infraction of the standard of right, a willful rebellion arising from a deliberate choice of the sinner. You say, well, how can that be? Well, we understand from Scripture, we understand particularly from Romans chapter 1, that even unbelieving people have a knowledge of God's law. Romans chapter 1, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness because what that which may be known of God is manifest in them. Verse 32 of that same chapter, who knowing the judgment of God or literally who knowing the ordinance or decree of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. And so sin, very simply, sin is acting, not acting without law or in ignorance of the law, but as an overt rebellion against what God has said against God's law and against his ways. The beginning of the verse, he gives us the definition of the sinner. It seems somewhat of a tongue twister. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is a transgression of the law. In a sense, he's saying the sinner is the one who sins. And what is sin? Sin is a overt act of rebellion against God. And the, the grammar that's used here, as we'll see throughout this text, really pictures a person that is actively engaged in sin. And so John lays out for us these definitions, sin being rebellion. And I think we need to pause as believers right here and just look at our lives. Look at our own lives. How do you view your sin? If you're a believer in Jesus Christ today, you understand sin. You understand the definition of sin. This wasn't new material for you. But the question you need to ask is how you look at what you do. It's very easy for us to say, you know what, God made me a certain way and I am just a hothead. And so when things happen, my nature is to react with wrath and anger. And we say, you know, that's just how God made me. And so therefore it's okay. Wrong. Wrong. 
when Scripture says things like, let all wrath be put away from you with all malice. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. It doesn't say, let only a little bit, every now and then, when you really get flustered and angry, then you can speak corruptly, you can speak rottenly. It doesn't say that. Ephesians 4.29 very explicitly says, no, none, ever. That's the standard. That's God's standard of communication. So it's easy for us, because I think we get in our, the most trouble with our tongue, as James points out. It's easy to say, well, that's not really overt rebellion against God. That's just me. That's not how God intends for you to live. We'll talk in a moment about Christ and the example that he portrayed. You say, well, I'm, you know, I don't have that problem. I, I'm very guarded with my language, but I, you know, I really have this problem of worry. I think about things a lot. I'm very analytical, and so I'm, I'm a worrier. But somehow for, for you, you call it worry anxiety, whatever definition you want to lay out. But that, that's not a sin. That's just the way God made me. I'm a detail-oriented person. I've got to figure everything out. I've got to have everything planned. Anybody like that in here? And yet, Scripture says what? Be careful for only the things that aren't obvious that you can't figure out. No, be careful for nothing. Have anxiety, be anxious for Nothing. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Matthew chapter 6. At the end of chapter 6, I believe it's verse 34, says what? Take no thought for tomorrow. Why? Because the things tomorrow take, take care of themselves. There's enough problems ahead, essentially. Don't worry about those things. God has it figured out. See, but my personality is to be a worrisome person. You're writing off your sin as being acceptable. And I think just by looking at this definition, we have to understand that we have made an overt choice to rebel against what God has said. It may be what you are prone to, but it is not what Christ desires for you to be. There's a difference. And so we need to make sure that we recognize really the rebellious, lawless element of our sin as a believer in Christ. You know, sin for a believer is not mandatory. You say, wait a minute, what do you mean? Well, Romans chapter 6 says this, For sin shall not have dominion over you. Christ gives us and has given us the victory in him, in his death and burial and resurrection. Christ put it this way, Verily I say unto you, Whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin. Verse 36 of John 8, If the Son shall therefore make you free, you shall be free indeed. We are free. So for you to say, you know, my personality is a worrisome personality, you are giving yourself a free pass on doing what God has said you should not do. You're making the choice to live in overt rebellion to what God has said. Is that easy to do? If you are prone to worry... I'd ask for a show of hands, but I won't, because my hand would be raised. We need to go back to Scripture, recognize what we're doing, call it what it is, call it sin, and seek God's help. And we have that help. So, our sin as believers is no less rebellious than the sin of a lost person. And so the first question we've answered from the text, text asked and answered, is what is sin? What is sin? Sin It's missing the standard God has set, and it involves rebellion against the will and law of God. And the sinner is one who does that, who practices that rebellion. The next question I think that comes at us from the text is, what is God's relationship towards sin? There's a couple of statements that are in this text that are interesting that help us understand that. Almost, they almost seem unnecessary. John is reminding us where God stands with respect to sin. And the first we find in in verses really 5 and 8, we find a statement regarding Christ's purpose for coming that helps us understand God's relationship towards sin, Christ's purpose. He has two purposes that we see there. The first is at the beginning of verse 5. And we know that he was manifest, why? To take away our sins. So Christ came to remove sin, not just to cover it. In other words, we understand the whole purpose of Christ's coming was to deal with this issue of sin. And from the very beginning, the very beginning of the book of John, we see... Christ being identified as one that would be taking away the sin of the world, the Lamb of God, which takes away 
the sin of the world. Paul writes in Titus chapter 2, speaking of Christ, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Christ came not just to destroy sin in the future, but to do so now. To destroy sin in your life now. We understand that those that have been redeemed, we still have the flesh, as the Bible calls it, our unredeemed humanists. We're still subject to temptation. We understand that. We know we won't be perfect. In fact, just two verses before our text, the Apostle John points out that it doesn't appear what we will be yet. And that we will be like Christ when we see him. So we understand that. Yet at the same time, it doesn't mean that we have an excuse to continue in sin. Because Christ came to do what? To remove it. To take it out of the way. Notice the second purpose of his coming. We see that in verse 8. For this is the purpose, the Son of God, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. He came to overthrow the devil's works. Destroy there has the idea to break up, to render powerless, to render it inoperable. To destroy the work of the devil, to break the power that the devil and his wickedness has over the life of a believer. One author put it this way, it's consequently, it's impossible and unthinkable that true believers would continue in devil-like behavior. Obviously, we're still opposed by him, the Bible tells us that. And yet we are no longer bound to do his works. And so the question or really the observation I want us to make about Christ's purpose in coming is to really recognize the incompatibility between someone that says, I am a believer in Jesus Christ. And and that set that same person hanging on to and engaging in and repeatedly engaging in sinful behavior. It doesn't it just doesn't make sense. It's contrary to the purpose of. For which Christ came. It's contrary to the purpose for which Christ redeemed you. He bought you out of sin. Can I say it this way? Sin for the believer should be more the exception than the rule. Or at least that's what we should be thinking about. I understand as we grow in Christ, we we recognize just how wicked we are. We recognize more thoroughly how we fall short of God's standard, and we are more sensitive to that. And I understand. I'm not saying we're going to be perfect. I understand that. Scripture, we just pointed that out. Verse 2 of chapter 3 here in 1 John. And yet, we need to have the right perspective. Christ died to make us holy. And therefore, to live contrary to that really doesn't make sense. And so the We understand God's relationship to sin by first recognizing Christ's purpose. His purpose was to eradicate sin from our lives, to positionally put us before God as justified and practically work out through us the living of his life. Call that sanctification, progressive sanctification. Notice a second relationship we see. It's almost just a small phrase tacked on to the end of verse 5 where the Bible points out, where John points out Christ's condition in coming. Notice And we know that he was manifest to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. In him is no sin. Again, that statement almost seems unnecessary because we understand that. And yet it helps us put our sin in perspective. Christ came to remove it, and he was completely free from sin. Scripture repeatedly points that out. Ephesians, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 5.21 God hath made him, or he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Christ came and was perfect. He was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. And yet the willingness of Christ to come and be defiled with sin that was not his own and completely inconsistent with who he is should serve as really a point of motivation for us to say, you know what, I need to be pursuing holiness with great vigor. Christ presents that perfect pattern. And so the question I'd like to ask us then is, how does that perfect pattern, what do we see in our daily lives? Again, we can write off our sin based on who we seem to be. What are, as I often say, as God has wired you. Maybe God, the way you're designed, is your nature, what is your personality? And yet God wants us to be like Christ. Christ. 
So we can't give any excuse to say, well, that's just, I'm just a worrier. I'm just a hothead. I'm just whatever. No, it, it's what Christ was and what Christ is and what he wants you to be and be working toward that. And so we've asked the second question, what is God's relationship to sin? His desire is to remove it completely. He's not tolerant of it. And then our attitude must be to mirror God's and his desire. Let's spend the rest of our time then really asking the third question. What is the difference between believers and unbelievers concerning sin? And this is where our text gets very interesting. As you likely read, you said, boy, there's some neat statements in there. I wonder how he's going to deal with those. Let's consider, first of all, the assertions that John makes about unbelievers concerning sin. He makes three key assertions about the believers, the unbelievers, rather, the lost person's spiritual relationship on the basis of his sinful living. So let's look at that. First of all, we see the first one in verse 6. At the end of verse 6, whosoever sinneth has not seen him or known him. And so we would say the first assertion he's making is that the sinner or the lost sinner does not know God. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither know him. Now, we'll look at John's assertions that pertain to believers in a moment, but this is a strong statement. He says, he says, whosoever sinneth essentially does not know God. One of the important things to understand what John is communicating here, because first of all, you could say, well, wait a minute. How many in here are sinned yet today? How many of you have sinned today? Okay, I should see a lot of hands, all right? Yes, and so we look at a text like this and says, whosoever sinneth doesn't know him. So we're all lost. Is that what John is saying? That's not what John is saying. And we'll talk about that in a moment. And so we need to understand the tense and really the the nature of the way John writes this. When he's talking about this, you'll see words like whosoever sinneth, whosoever practices sin, whosoever doeth doeth not righteousness. In almost every case, John is writing in a way that describes something that is a habit of life, a habitual practice. One author put it this way, it's the habitual action of defiance and rebellion in a fallen heart. Or someone that practices sin as the ruling principle of their lives. And so as he's described this lost sinner, he does not know God. It does not demonstrate any changed attitude in his relationship towards sin. Regardless of the profession he's made, I think we've all met people that have made a profession of knowing Christ or coming to Christ. And yet you look at their lives and there is really no change in their attitude towards spiritual things. There's no change in their relationship to sin. And so John would say, listen, whosoever continueth in that hath not seen him, neither has known him. All right. John James rather points out to us that when we come to faith in Christ, that faith will have some demonstrative works, right? Show me thy, uh, show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. John James says in James two eighteen. He goes on to say at the end of that chapter that faith without works is dead, and so we understand that a true believer will have actions of obedience that demonstrate his faith. So John's first assertion is that the unimpeded practice of sin reveals a life that has not truly come to Christ. Notice his second assertion in verse eight, the beginning of verse eight. He that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. So the lost sinner is aligned with the devil. The idea of, again, committeth sin there is the idea of makes a practice of. And one author uh, explained it this way. The sinner makes a trait of it. It's something that is something they're continually doing. It's an ongoing style of life. And, of course, Christ pointed that out to the Pharisees in John 8. He called them of their father, the devil. And so by practicing sin, you're aligning with the devil. Notice the third assertion. The final assertion he makes that the lost sinner is not a child of God in verse 10. In this, the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doth not righteousness is not of God. And so here he points out there are two groups of people in the world. Those that are children of God and those that are children of the devil. And those that are aligned with the devil are easy to identify, according to John. We can look at what they're practicing to determine with whom they are aligned. And those that are habitually living in a pattern of living reveals the truth about their spiritual condition. Those that are sinning are, are not of God. And so I guess the question I would ask today, those that are here today and those that are listening today, have you been born 
Again, in other words, have you seen the issue and struggle with doing right in your life and find it unable to do so? Well, it's quiet in here, isn't it? The fans are off. Are you struggling with sin and are not getting victory? What does your life, what does that mean? Are you in Christ? Because in Christ, we have the power to live correctly. We have the power. And that should be obvious. That should be obvious. We'll talk about that more in a minute. And so we find that sin is a defining factor in the life of the unbeliever. He practices sin as a habit of life. And in doing so, aligns himself with the wicked one. Now, let's move on to John's assertions about believers. He makes four of them. And I think in many ways we have an easier time with the statements he makes concerning unbelievers. Because he he makes them in very absolute terms, and we understand that. And he equally makes some absolute assertions about believers. Let's look at them, not necessarily in the order that he wrote them, but in the order, what I would call the order of severity, the order of absoluteness, if that's a word. Notice in verse 7, he first of all asserts that the believer practices righteousness. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. And I think John's acknowledging that no man can do what is right apart from a proper relationship with God. We've come into fellowship with God. We've received a new nature. What does it say in 2 Corinthians 5? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is what? He is a new creature. We have new life. And so if we're doing righteousness, it's not because of anything in ourselves, but because of the righteousness we have from Christ. We've been redeemed and have the ability to do what's right. And that can be an assuring thing. It can help us see that God is working in us, that we have trusted him. We have the ability to see the fruit. And again, doing righteousness doesn't make us believers, but it helps us understand that God has done a work in us. It reveals our relationship. Again, the language that John uses here asserts that it's not just an occasional act, but it's a practice of life, a practice of life. And so his first assertion for believers is that the relation and our relationship towards sin is that believers will be practicing righteousness as a habit of life. Now, when you look at a life of a believer, there will be spiritual fruit there. Notice like the next assertion a bit, a bit stronger in verse six, the beginning of verse six. The believer abiding in Christ does not sin. He says in verse 6, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. I think we recognize that if we're walking in the Spirit, we're abiding in Christ, we're living in an obedient way, and therefore we are not committing sin. Notice Galatians 5. It says this, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Galatians 5.25, If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And again, the idea of abiding here has the idea of an ongoing relationship with Christ, which is really the essential feature of our identity in him. John explains what this abiding means down in verse 24 of the same chapter here in 1 John chapter 3. He says, who, the one who keeps his commandments abides in him. In other words, it has the idea of obedience. We obey Christ and we're abiding in him. We keep his commandments. Now, I don't think John intends this to be, but we can easily say, okay, there's an option I have here. I can choose to abide in Christ and live obediently, or I can just choose to not and walk in my flesh. And I think we recognize that there are times when we do not abide in Christ. I don't know that John's this thing, okay, you have an option. You can be a believer and do whatever you want. Or you can be a believer and abide in Christ. I think John, the emphasis that John's making is abide in him. He that abides in him does not sin. What does, does righteousness. And so the second assertion pertaining to believers and their relationships towards sin is as we abide in Christ, we will, obedient, will be obedient and will not sin. We understand that. Notice the third assertion, again, getting stronger. Verse 9, beginning of verse 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. In other words, a believer does not practice sin. Again, John is using the idea here that our commission of sin is not an ongoing habit of life. He's not continuing in sin. And it's written very clearly. It's not, there's really no amb- ambiguity there. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. 
It seems to be a universal statement. So as I read that, I ask some questions like, does that mean that as a believer, I won't ever commit the same sin twice? Does that mean that as a believer, um, I won't even be tripped up on a repeated basis by the same sin? What does the scripture tell us? Does the scripture give us guidance on this? All of your heads should be nodding like this. Now, what does Hebrews chapter 12 tell us? Very helpful. Right at the beginning of that chapter, it tells us to lay aside every weight. Lay aside those things that are not conducive to running. The author of Hebrews is giving a picture of running a race. He says, those things that are not conducive to you to running the race of a believer, lay those aside. In other words, you don't see very, very, very many marathon runners running with all the water that they're going to need on that entire 26-mile run, right? I mean, they don't have like a couple gallon jugs of water. Have you ever seen that? No. Now, they'd never be able to finish. What, water, what is that, like eight pounds a gallon or something like that? I mean, it would be impossible. And so there are things that we're called to lay aside that may not be sinful with our hindrances, but notice what it says as it goes on. And the sin that doth so easily beset us. Get rid of that, too. And two verse, three verses later, four verses later, he says, you've not resisted to the point of, uh, you've not resisted under blood, striving against sin. In other words, we do struggle. We do struggle with sin. And yet we understand from 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that there are no sins that will ultimately overcome us. Let me read the passage, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above your able, but with the temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. In other words, as a believer in Christ, and even as you go on in the passage in Hebrews chapter 12, it goes into this, the discussion of how God does not allow a believer to continue in unimpeded sin. He, as a father, will come alongside and correct and chasten and help you understand. It even goes on to say, let me read it, it says that um, he, he chastens us after... He chastened us so that we would be partakers of his holiness. In other words, so they would yield the fruit of righteousness. And so I think as John makes this assertion, as a believer, we will, as recipients of the new birth, we will not continue in the regular practice of sin, either because we will be convicted and recognized or because God will judge us for it and chasten us for it, just as you as a parent do. Your child is off playing in the mud. I mean, I mean unless you just enjoy Muddy children. I mean, you're probably going to go out there and correct them and say, wait a minute, this is not where I want you to play. I want you to play on the playground, not in the mud pile. If you have boys, you do that a lot. You get them out of the mud pile. I don't know, maybe girls do that too. I, I don't know. I don't have that experience. But, but even as a father chases his children, God chastens us and helps us and corrects us. And then John makes one final assertion, a very strong assertion. Verse 9 I'll start at the beginning of verse 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. He goes on to say, For a seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. The idea of the seed remaining in the believer is really that principle of new life that God plants in us. The salvation is described as a new birth or regeneration. In Titus chapter 3, it talks about the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. In Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul speaks of a new man being created in righteousness and true holiness. And so the statement that John makes is a very interesting statement. Do you think John is saying that you, as a believer in Christ, literally cannot sin anymore? We know that's not what he's saying, because what does he say at the beginning of his letter? John chapter 1, what does he say at the beginning of the letter? If you think you don't sin, you are what? A liar. A liar. Yeah, so John is not saying, listen, you cannot sin. What he's saying here is he's pointing out, particularly with the comparison of the new life that we have. I think one author explains it well. We have to recognize that the statement is grounded in the inconsistency between the practice of sin and the nature of the divinely bestowed new birth. In other words, our new life in Christ and our old life in sin are so radically inconsistent that to continue to live in sin, practice sin, is just a way is completely unbelievable, inconsistent. It should not be 
it should not be the case. Again, his, the way he writes the tense he uses cannot sin suggests that habitual practice of sinning. We're born of God, and it's incompatible with our new life in Christ. And so the question really for us to focus on today as believers in, in Jesus Christ, and I would guess that most of us are. There may be some here that don't know Christ. You don't know what it means to be born again. If that's your, if that's your situation, then you have no power over sin. You do sin by have it by nature. And Christ came to redeem you from that, to save you from your sin, to give you victory, to give you new life, to have the ability to have a relationship with God. As a believer, you have been redeemed. Sin doesn't have the same power over you. And really, the challenge I would make to you today is look at your sin the way God does. Look at these statements that John has made. What in your life is a recurring, as Hebrews writes, a besetting sin, something that is going on frequently? Maybe tomorrow morning when you get in the car to drive to work and drop the kids off, you pretty much already know how that's going to go. There's going to be bickering. There's going to be arguing. There's going to be yelling. You already know it. So if you had my kids, you'd have the same problem. I got kids too. And sometimes there is exactly that in my car. That's how I know. And yet we have to understand that that is absolutely incompatible with what we have in Christ. We have been restored to spiritual life. And it's not like God doesn't give us the rules. I don't mean the rules. The manner in which we're supposed to live. I mean, the basic things that we do in life, communicating with one another, how we're to act towards one another, the attitudes we're supposed to have about ourselves, the attitudes we're supposed to have about other people, how we're supposed to interrelate with one another in a local assembly. These things aren't a mystery, folks. I mean, we could take just one book. We could take the book of Ephesians. If all we had, let's just say we lived somewhere and the only book of the Bible we had was Ephesians. Quite frankly, we would have enough instruction, enough light to deal with all, really most of the personal interaction problems that we have. He deals with our relationship with our families. He deals with our relationship with our employers. He deals with our relationship in the local church. He tells us how we're supposed to talk. Very clear. So we, we don't have any excuse. I mean, how many copies of Scripture do you have? And today, literally, we can have it with us every moment. I have the ability with this device, and I don't have my phone with me, but with that device and my laptop, to literally to have all the notes that I ever write all in one place, all at the same time. I mean, we have, and I know not all of you are electronically savvy, I understand that, but we have the ability in our day and the resources that are unparalleled, unparalleled, to understand what God's truth is. We have no excuse. Absolutely no excuse. It's not a matter of not having God's word in our dialect. We've got it. And so to live as if we don't recognize sin for what it is, is just absolutely inconsistent with what God's word says. And to write off what we do and saying that's the way I am, is inconsistent with our redemption. Because Christ isn't that way. And the way we talk to one another and the things we say... Oh, my. Oh, my. Line some of those up with these statements that John has said. Whosoever born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin. Because he's born of God. And yet what comes out of our mouths repeatedly is inconsistent. That's not right. That's exactly what John is saying. Listen, it can't, it, those two things can't live together. James, the apostle, writes an amazing statement, if I'm able to find it quickly. Verse 8 of chapter 3. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. He goes on to say, Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing, 
My brother, in these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can a fig tree, my brother, and bear olive berries, either a vine fig? So can, so can no fountain yield salt water and fresh. Or we pray and we bless God. We turn around and curse each other. It's absolutely inconsistent. You don't go to a fountain of water and push the button and expect the first time you push it to get fresh water, the next, pump, the next time you push it to get salt water. It doesn't work that way. You have to have two different sources. It doesn't work. You don't go to your grapevine and pluck apples off of it, right? If you've got, if you got a, a grapevine like that, let me know. I mean, that'd be pretty unusual. Oh, you go to your apple tree to get apples. And if it's rotten, what does it say? What does Christ say? Out of the abundance of the heart, what? The mouth speaks. If you speak rotten things, it's because you've got a rotten heart. We need to make sure that we look at what the Bible defines as sin, that we recognize that and that we function like believers and not like unbelievers. Does that mean we're always going to be perfect? No, we know that. John knew that. He wrote it in verses 2 and 3. We're not going to be perfect until we see Christ. And yet what he did write, what he did write is significant. Verse 3 of chapter 3. And every man that hath this hope, what hope? The hope of being with Christ one day and being like Christ instantly in his presence does what? He purifies himself even as he is pure. Well, that is really the introduction to this whole discussion of sin. Listen, if you're of Christ... You have the hope of being with Christ. You will be like Christ. You have that hope. This is what you're doing. You're getting out of sin as much as you can. You're purifying yourself just like Christ. That is your focus. That is your priority. You're going to the Word and saying, listen, it is inconsistent with the seed that is in me to continue in my sin. I am born of God. It's not who you are. It's who you will be in Christ. It's a difficult text. And if I've misspoken words that maybe you're confused by, I trust that those will be lost. The bottom line is we must purify ourselves even as he is pure and stop giving ourselves a free pass on sin. Let's pray.